When you graduate from high school, there's a lot of ways you imagine your life can turn out. But when something horrible happens to someone you knew, like finding their body engulfed in flames as they walk towards you down the road, those are the types of things that go beyond your imagination. Welcome back to Killer Bites, your favorite show bringing you all the hottest true crime stories in bite-sized pieces. Today, we're talking about the murder of Jessica Chambers and how justice for her death has yet to be served. I'm Zach, let's get into it. Our story today takes place in Cortland, Mississippi, a small town with a population of around 500 people. This is where Jessica Chambers grew up. Born in 1995 to parents Ben and Lisa, Jessica was known as a popular cheerleader in high school. She was also known to be a pretty tough woman from the rough childhood she'd been through. In the early 2000s, her dad had been convicted on charges of making <laughs> as well as drunk driving. She was also witness to her neighbor being shot in their yard several times. Her father started working as a mechanic for the local police force, and Jessica had found not exactly a metropolis, but something a bit more big city than her hometown. But people around Jessica began to notice that she had started to fall in with a different crowd, one they thought would bring her trouble. She became associated with convicted drug dealers and got a boyfriend named Travis Sanford, who was soon put in jail on criminal charges. For nearly six weeks, Jessica began to express concerns to her father that people thought she was a snitch because of his connections to the police department. She never elaborated more than this, but it seemed that tensions were high and something was troubling her. On December 6, 2014, according to her phone records, 19-year-old Jessica spent the day with her mom and some friends about town. In the afternoon, she went home and took a nap, and then at around 5 p.m., she got a message from someone. Her mom recalls Jessica telling her that she was going out to grab some food and would be back soon. A few miles from a wooded area at a Cortland gas station, video cameras caught Jessica at around 5.30 p.m., putting about $14 worth of gas in her car before leaving the station and heading towards Batesville at 6 p.m., a city only five miles away from her hometown. According to her phone's coordinates, she then drove back to Cortland at around 6.30 and called her mother, Lisa. Lisa noted that she could feel something was off because her daughter seemed very quiet on the other end of the line. Jessica's phone coordinates then showed that she drove her car out to the middle of a heavily wooded area and parked her car there at about 7.30. What happened next would shock the entire town. A passing motorcyclist at around 8 p.m noticed a burning car in the woods and the figure of what appeared to be a human stumbling in the ditch nearby beside it, engulfed in flames. They immediately called 911. When emergency rescue services arrived on the scene, they could make out a burning figure about 30 feet in front of them. As they got closer, they would find Jessica on fire. One firefighter, a former schoolmate of Jessica's, recalled that the fire was so hot it had burned all of Jessica's clothes off and singed her hair down to a frayed crisp. In that moment, he admits that her burns were so bad, he couldn't tell it was his former classmate at all. Over 98% of Jessica's body had been burned, and the flames were so hot that her black car had turned white under the heat of the fire. Firefighters immediately wrapped her body in blankets and jackets as they tried to put her out. Once they laid her down by the fire truck, they assessed that there was little they could do for her extreme third degree burns. But they recounted that Jessica was strong and she was trying to talk to them. So, in order to assess the damage to her lungs and try to comfort her in her last moments, they spoke to her. They asked her if she knew who did this to her. As she was dying, she said, Eric set me on fire. But because of the condition of her body and lungs, the paramedics say they swore that she said the name Derek instead. She would pass away from her injuries the next day in a Memphis hospital. Law enforcement was on the scene, raiding the area, and found Jessica's car keys had been thrown on the side of the road a few miles away from where her car was discovered. Family and local friends also arrived at the scene where Jessica's car remained covered under a blue tarp, waiting to be surveyed for evidence. But it was strange, you see, because even though Jessica had named an Eric or Derek as her killer, no one knew of any friends or contacts Jessica knew with that name. Obviously, local police started their investigation off with this clue anyway. They interviewed every Eric or Derek in the area and ruled any of them out as being suspects in the case. Jessica's boyfriend, Travis, was also ruled out because he was still in jail. And again, according to Jessica's phone records, she hadn't done anything that strange the day leading up to her death except when she randomly traveled to Batesville. Police began to question the darker side of Jessica's inner circle, like convicted drug dealers that she knew, current and ex-gang members, etc. But still, nothing. 
Finally, police decided to put out a $54,000 reward to the public for anyone who could come forward and help their case by giving details or information about anything that led up to Jessica's death. With this new reward, they were able to question about 150 new people, but they still didn't have any leads. The next year, in February of 2016, law enforcement finally had a solid lead and charged 27-year-old Quentin Tellis for the murder of Jessica Chambers. While he did have a previous record of committing crimes like burglary and drug possession, this charge seemed to come out of nowhere for some. But besides the messages and communication they had found between Jessica and Quentin, what really set off alarms for law enforcement was the fact that Quentin was being charged for another murder in a nearby state. Quentin was a gang member with a long rap sheet, and in 2015, he had been arrested and had charges pressed against him for credit card theft and the murder of Ming Chen Xiao, a 34-year-old University of Louisiana Monroe student from Taiwan. The pair had been seen on camera at a nearby Walmart, but police had also received calls from Ming Chen's neighbor saying that she had felt something odd about the man, Quentin, that was following Ming Chen around. She gave the police Quentin's license plate number just in case. The neighbor also noted that she had seen Quentin enter Ming Chen's apartment and was able to hear them arguing through the walls. A few days later, Ming Chen went missing. And 10 days after that, her body was discovered in her apartment with nearly 30 stab wounds and her credit cards missing. Shortly after that, Ming Chen's bank received a call to the 24-hour helpline. You know, the one that's written on the back of everyone's cards. Someone on the other line was trying to ask for help accessing the account. Police later were able to trace the number back to Quentin's account and cell phone. Quentin admitted to the credit card fraud, but he pleaded not guilty to the murder. But the court couldn't move forward with Ming Chen's case until a verdict for Jessica's trial had been settled. And Jessica's family rejoiced in finally being able to put a face to the mysterious culprit who had taken their daughter's life. Jessica's father, Ben, told news outlets that he hoped Quentin would receive the proper punishment he deserved, even if that meant the death penalty. But he also went on record to say that they felt sorry towards Quentin's family, who also had to be put through this kind of treatment and shame. He's not only destroyed our family, he's destroyed his family, Ben said. Convicting Quentin on Jessica's murder charges turned out to be difficult even though there was a mountain of evidence against him. Police were first able to track and connect Quentin to Jessica through her phone records. They looked up old text message records, GPS location points, etc., and all things pointed out that Quentin had not only been in contact with Jessica several weeks before her murder, but he was also the last one to have texted her before her death. Quentin gave a ton of alibis. Notice how I added an S to that one? That's because Quentin's stories seemed to turn into tall tales at the police station. First, he claimed that he had only been with Jessica in her car until 7 p.m., and that after that, he went to a friend's house and crashed at his place. However, the police then interviewed said friend who denied everything. He told police he was nowhere near Quentin because he had gone to a football game, and they were able to confirm his attendance through his tickets and other means at the stadium. But after that, Quentin had another alibi ready. He said what really happened was that the pair went to a Taco Bell in the opposite town, then went back to his house, sat in the car in the driveway, and listened to music together. Quentin claimed that Jessica then left his house at 7 p.m., 30 minutes before she had been set on fire. Now, if you've been listening closely to the story, you already know that this alibi is a no-go too. Not only did Jessica's phone records disprove this, but remember the gas station footage? It's all right there with timestamps and everything. There's no way Jessica could have been with Quentin until 7 p.m. Footage from the police's questioning of Quentin revealed that they tried to smooth talk him into a confession by pointing out that it was more likely Jessica had driven with someone to the middle of the woods where she was killed rather than meet someone there. There are no houses, buildings, or anything nearby just trees for miles around. They pointed out that his and Jessica's cell phone records showed that they had been near each other in the wooded location. But Quentin held tight to his innocence. Quentin's DNA sample was also taken, and the police were able to match it with some DNA that had been found on Jessica's car keys that had been thrown on the side of the road. And, as coincidence would have it, they also discovered that the place Jessica's car keys were thrown wasn't just a few miles away from her burning car. It turns out that they also happened to only be a few miles away from Quentin's sister's house. Surveillance footage showed Quentin had been using his sister's car that night and had left her place and headed towards Jessica's location at around 7.50 p.m. Cell phone records were also able to prove that an hour after Jessica's death, Quentin had deleted all messages and data that had a connection to Jessica. 
The data from these deleted messages was retrieved by police and further revealed that Quentin had been pursuing Jessica for weeks and continually asking her to have sex with him. But Jessica rejected Quentin every single time. Finally, on the day of her death, he had asked her four times that day to sleep with him, and again she had said no every time. Because of all this evidence, the police felt confident in their decision to charge Quentin in Jessica's murder case in February of 2016. Quentin pled not guilty. The first trial began later that year, but this is where things get a little crazy. Prosecutors made the argument in court that what they believed had happened to Jessica was that while in her car in Quentin's driveway, she had been pestered by his plea for sex once again and denied him. This, they believe, sent him into a rage where he suffocated her. Once she was unconscious and thought to be dead, Quentin drove her car back towards her hometown and left her and it in the middle of the woods. He would then trek back on foot towards his sister's home, throwing out Jessica's keys in the process. Once there, they say he used his sister's car to go back to his own home, pick up gasoline, and drive back to Jessica's location, where he would then set her on fire. Quentin's defense said that the real killer had to have been this Eric or Derek that Jessica had named. And Quentin revealed to police that a sex offender named Derek Holmes had actually been stalking Jessica a few weeks prior to her death. Neighbors confirmed that they had seen the pair together a few times. But police were able to rule this out quickly because Derek's alibi was solid. He'd been home around the time of the murder, and there were many witnesses that could testify to this. Medical witnesses, like doctors and other emergency response workers, testified in court that it would have been extremely difficult for Jessica to speak properly in the state she was in before her death because of her severe burns. They pointed out that even when she had stated her name to the firefighters, she said her last name was Yambers because she was unable to say Chambers due to her severe burns. Prosecutors made the argument that maybe from the state of her swollen lips, scorched tongue, and other horrific burns, that maybe, somehow, Eric could have been away to Quentin. I think the prosecution was reaching a bit too far on that claim, though. When the jury finally had come to a decision, it seems they didn't understand exactly how to do their job. From courtroom footage, it was revealed that they didn't understand what the word unanimous meant. So, when the judge asked them if they all voted on the same thing, they said yes. Then suddenly one jury member said no. The judge then got a bit flustered and sent them back to deliberate and told them to re-vote properly this time. They came back an hour later and said they couldn't reach a verdict. They were deadlocked and tied in votes. A mistrial was declared and a new trial began in September 2018. But that trial also ended in a deadlock and was also labeled a mistrial. Quentin's trial in Ming Chen's case finally began to move forward since a decision had yet to be made in Jessica's case. A verdict was decided. Quentin was found guilty for the theft of only Ming Chen's credit card and sentenced to 10 years in a correctional center in Monroe, Louisiana. He was then extradited down to Mississippi to face his next trial in the Jessica Chambers case, but the prosecution said they want to check with Jessica's family and wait a bit before trying him for a third time. And that's the story of Jessica Chambers' death, her unsolved case, and messy trials. I hope the truth of Jessica's death will be revealed someday, and that her family will be able to find peace. But more than that, I can't believe this case has had so many mistrials. With the evidence I've seen, I have my own thoughts about who did it. But what about you? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks again for tuning into Killer Bites. Stay safe out there, everybody. I'm Zach, we'll see you next time.